We're going to share this with everybody, and of course we're disappointed when we find out everybody doesn't want to know that. Now, they said to me, Brother Mumford, I don't want that gifts business. Don't talk to me about that gift, tongues, interpretation, and healing, and all that business. All I want is love. I want the gift of love. I said, well, isn't that interesting? If anybody can show me where love is a gift, I'll eat this thing, Morocco bindings and all. <laughs> gift, is, is love a gift? Anybody find out where love is a gift? And is Paul contrasting love and gifts? That's interesting. And here we have a situation that, that, that has brought more confusion and difficulty to the church of Jesus Christ. Now, will you listen for one moment while I speak to your spirit today? There is nothing any more frustrating than to love someone and not be able to help them. Billy Graham told about the time he was in Australia, and he made an altar call, and one of the first people that came to the altar call was a little blind boy, or a young man he was, really. He wasn't a little boy, but he was a young man. He was a blind boy. And he stood there, and, and Billy said to Oral Roberts, by the way, some of you were there at the dedication, Oral Roberts, or Billy Graham preached the dedication War Roberts University, about 15,000 people there. Tremendous, tremendous experience. But he said, that young man stood there blind, and he said to Oral Roberts, he said, Oral, something inside of me rose up, and he said, I wanted to lay my hands on that young man. And he said, I didn't do it. And he said, Oral, I know if you would have been there, you would have laid your hands on him, and God would have healed him. Now, what, what Billy Graham was feeling there is what I would like to be able to share with you today. When he spoke this, it only put into words what I was feeling over the, over the, over the years as I watched the gifts and ministries in operation. Now, Paul said, if you're coveting for a gift, that's wonderful. Just keep on coveting. Oh, that's good. If you, if you feel God wants to use you in the gift of healing, you just seek that. If you feel God wants to use you in the gift of prophecy, you just keep right on seeking. But let me, let me tell you, there is a better way. And he said, there is? How many of you know that uh, I used to tell my people, there's three ways of doing things. When we were in the Navy, they said there's a right way, the wrong way, and the Navy way. <laughs> the Navy has its own peculiar way of doing everything. It really does. And, and they said there's a right way, the wrong way, and the Navy. But in, in walking with Jesus, we're soon going to learn that there's a right way, a wrong way, and there's what? God's way. God has his own peculiar way of doing things. He does it the way he wants to do it, and no man can say, what doest thou? No man can do that. All right? So he says, I'll show you that there is a better way, and there is a way of doing this that works in a better way. Now, I made the statement a moment ago, that there's nothing more frustrating than to love somebody and not be able to help them. I studied surgery. My wife and I, we were studying medicine in preparation to go to the mission field. And uh, on one occasion, we, I was assisting a surgeon, and uh, we made an incision on a woman who had, later we found out, who had cancer of the... Um, of the um, the head of the pancreas, a huge cancerous tumor. And we opened this woman, and, uh, and, uh, and as Elmder, the doctor looked in there, and when he saw that, he was, I never saw a more devastated look in all my life. Here was a man committed to helping people. He was a surgeon 
a man who loved people, who loved his, his work. And he made this huge incision, opened this lady, and he looked in, and there we saw this great cancerous mass. And I looked, and he looked, and he looked in my eyes, and I looked in his, and he stood there, and he turned white. Tears filled his eyes, and he stood there, and he was helpless, and so was I. We stood there helpless. No, no one could do anything to help that woman, and there we stood. Now, that man was full of compassion, full of love was he for people who were sick and hindered. But there he was, with all of medical science, with all that he had, at his background and of his training, he stood there helpless. Now, I say that only to illustrate to you, my brother and my sister, there is nothing more frustrating than to love people and not be able to help them. But God has put in the church not only love, but he has put in the church the nine gifts the ministries of the Holy Spirit, that not only can we love people, but we can also, uh, tell me, we can help them. God has placed within our disposal, within the church of Jesus Christ, not only the ability to love people, but also to help them. Uh, I, I have had the most amazing experience in the last about a year and a half or so. I go up to denominational and, and uh, other ministers, and I say to the pastor or, or preacher or reverend, how goes the battle? They look at me, many, many of them, tears just fill their eyes. They said to me, Bob, I'm all about on the verge of a mental breakdown. I am almost at my wit's end. I am about ready to crack up. Sin and sickness and corruption and ungodliness and demon activity and all kinds of things are pressing in on the church, and I don't know what to do about it. I said, ah, oh, you're talking to the right man. <laughs> the Lord has given us tools. How would you like for someone to come to you and say, uh, I don't know if there's a contractor here in our audience. Perhaps there is. And I'd say to him, Sir, I want you to build me a house. And he'd say, Fine. But I won't give you any money. And I won't give you any tools, any saws, any hammers, any nails. I just want you to build me one. And he stands there looking at the trees. And he looks at the situation. And it's impossible. He says, Well, I can't do that. Because I know that God never spoke to us to build a church, to help people, to minister, to share, to, to, to do the work of an evangelist, to do the work of the ministry and not give us equipment, saws, hammers, levels, uh, what's that thing you look through and level the ground, what's that thing, somebody help me, uh, what is it? Transit, yeah, and all the things that you need to be a contractor and to work and build the church. All right? Now, let me, let me follow this through for a moment. Paul says, I want to show you that there is a way to let the gifts and ministries to operate in your life. I don't care who you are or how... Uh, what your background or education is. And Paul said, I'll show you how it works if you listen to me. Now, if you want to go on coveting, then go on coveting. That's wonderful. Hallelujah. And I'll, I'll, I'll say amen. You say, you're going to say, Brother Mumford's trying to take something from us. I know the Bible says, covet earnestly the best gifts, and I'm just going to covet. I said, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Go at it, brother. But if you are looking... And if there has been within your own heart some sort of a frustration, well, Brother Mumford, how do I actually begin? Now, hear me. How do I actually begin to let the gifts and the ministries of the Holy Spirit begin to function in my life? 
how do I really, how do I get my boat launched? Uh, while I was in Bible college, I went to one of my professors and I said to him, Sir, will you teach me about the gifts and ministries of the Holy Spirit? He said to me, Mumford, get your boat floating and I'll show you how to steer it. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, that's not a very nice answer. But you see, why should we have negative teaching on the gifts of the Spirit? Why should we have teaching on the gifts of the Spirit if there are no gifts operating? Why should we teach, be careful the devil don't get you, be careful of extremes and be careful of fanatics and be careful. And I put up all the static of all the fears and all the things that could happen and all the errors and all the wrong things and I teach and teach. And I have been in, in churches where they teach for three months on the negative operations of the gifts of the Spirit. And then they said, all right, now, people, we want you to prophesy. Who can prophesy in that atmosphere? Who's going to obey the Lord then? Who's going to ever move out in the realm of the gifts of the Spirit? Not me. <laughs> Not me. No, sir. All right. Now, we want to say to you, if you don't mind, I brought a blackboard in here this afternoon because I want to show you that in God's timing, there are, there are some words for love, and I hope to clarify something to you if I can. Would you bring that blackboard up here for me, please? And I want to try to stay near the um, black, near the, uh, no, right here I think we can see it. And I want to put on the board, will you look over with me to Galatians chapter uh, 5, if you would please, and uh, see if we can read a few scriptures. That's fine, brethren, thank you very much. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, and we want to if we can, to establish a verse of Scripture here in the Word of God. Ephesians, I mean, uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. While I was seeking the Lord for what to share this afternoon, these are the only words that God spoke to me. About two weeks ago, these words began to ring in my heart over and over and over again, faith which worketh by love. Faith which worketh by love. Faith which worketh by love. Would you say that with me aloud, everyone, please? Faith which worketh by love. Say it again. Faith which worketh by love. Now, in the Scriptures, and I'll have to give you this sort of quickly, but I do want to give it to you. In the Scriptures, there are several, several words for love. And some of you may, this may be children's teaching to some of you, but you bear with us while we share with others who perhaps do not understand this. But in the Scriptures, there are words for love. In English, we only have one word. We say... I love my dog, I love my wife, I love my church, and I love God. Now, certainly, you don't love God with the same love that you love your dog. But, see, in English, we only have one word. And so we are helpless, we are truly helpless to express ourselves in a word that really means what we want to say. But in the Greek, we have a beautiful selection of words. The old adage is, the Greeks have a word for it. And, and so, believe me, they do. When you start studying it, you really realize they have nine words for this. And when you start studying it, you realize how beautiful, how dramatic the language really is. But there is a word, and this word is this, and I'll put it up here so you can see it. And this word is eros, and we'll work on that. There's another word which says this, storgop, which is a, a word, Greek word for love. And there's another word which is phileo. This is another word. And then there's another word which is 
agape, and uh, we'll just, we want to just make a very simple comment on these four words here. Can you see that? Uh, everyone, I hope you... Is that too low for you? Can you see that? If you can, I'll just speak about it. But this word eros in the Greek word love. Love, he says. Now, this word is a word which is used for sex. It's a word, a word eros, erotic. And it's a word which means sex. And we know that term from... from, uh, uh, from um, Dictionary, the world uses a profane word, erotic, and it's not always a bad word, but it can be a bad word. Now, there's another word, storgos, which means a family love, a family love, which means I love my aunt, I love my grandmother. It's a love which I don't think about. It just becomes mine because I, I love my grandmother because she's my grandmother. And uh, so then you have another word which is used, and this is the word that's used so many times in the Bible. Uh, Romans 14, I think it's verse 13. Let brotherly love continue. Now, phileo, and I want to use this word, reciprocation. All right? Now, this word, reciprocation, means... I send my love out, and you send love back to me. I said, oh, Brother Roy, it's good to see you here at Harrisburg. Now, that's, that's when I'm sending my love out. Now, what does he say to me? Brother Mumford, good to see you here. See, so I send my love out, and he sends his love back to me. And I said, oh, isn't it wonderful to have brotherly love. How many of you know Philadelphia is the city of brotherly shove? <laughs> uh, phila, that's a word, philos, philos, and the word del delphia is a word, lo br brotherly love. And this word is used many times. Now, let me show you how this works with the Christmas cards. You see, Christmas cards are sent out on the basis of Philadelphia. See, I send you a card, right? We have a little book, and it says sent, and what's the other column say? Receive. So after I send you all a Christmas card, and, uh, and I go back through my thing, and I find out what? You didn't send me one. <laughs> I'll scratch your name off the book. I said, I sent Mrs. Brown one three years in a row, and she never sent me one. Off with you, lady, that's all. Now, there's nothing wrong with brotherly love. We need it. We need it. I said, oh, honey, you're looking good today. And she said, you look pretty good yourself. Oh. Amen. I said, good to see you, brother Ebal. And he said, oh, brother Mumford, it's good to see you. Now, I want to take you one more step. Suppose I say, brother Ebal, it's good to see you. And he says, it's not very good to see you. Uh-oh. Now, you see, this is where most people just go down in defeat. Uh, <laughs> most people don't know that there's a, one other kind of love in God. This is God's love. This love is God's love. And this love is translated by a one-way sign. Yes. This is translated by a one-way sign. This is God's love that's flowing from God to me, out to those that are in need. Oh, folk. Yes. Amen. I thought somebody had a question. But here's a love that is there. So when I say to Brother Roy, I say, Brother Roy, it's so good to see you in Harrisburg. And he says, well, it's not very good to see you. Oh, I say, well, I thank God I have one more love to love you with. Amen. You see, I have then a, some kind of a love that I can love him with, and that is whose love? God's love. And so he says to me, I never did like you, Mumford. And I say, well, brother, I love you anyhow. Amen. See, because this love isn't looking for anything in return. This love never looks for anything back. It just loves and loves 
and love and love. What kind of love do you think is found in John 3, verse 16? For God so what? loved the world. See, this love, now I, I need to press this out just one other little bit. This love is emotion. See, this is Hollywood love. Hollywood says, oh, I'm falling in love, and I can't help it. <laughs> oh, you're not talking Bible love. <laughs> See, my daughter says, oh, Daddy, I'm falling in love, and I can't help it. I said, well, I can help it. <laughs> I can show you. I can show you where the Bible says this love is an emotional love, and it bends the will. See, when the emotions are stirred, it makes the will do what it doesn't want to do. You say, Brother Mumford, don't you trust your daughter out in the back of an automobile? I trust my daughter, but I don't trust Eros. Once your emotions are stirred, do you know why they have a test drive, a new Bonneville? Why do you think they put a new Bonneville Pontiac out and let you test drive it? Because soon as you get your hands on that wheel and you feel that thing purr and all those 497 horses under there, something rises in you and you say, oh, I got to have this. You see? And Eros makes the will bend. And you said, honey, we're going to buy that. You see, we can't afford it where we'll make sure we'll do something. We'll quit paying the doctor and we'll pay, we'll buy the new Bonneville, right? You see, this is what happens. This is eros. This is something that is stirred from the emotions. Now, agape is born in the will. This is something that is, that is born in the will of man. God loved the world, not because it was lovely, but why? Because they needed it, didn't they? What word do you think husbands is used when it says, husbands, love your wives? What word do you think is used up here? <laughs> come on, come on. Husbands, what? Agape. Love your wife. Even if she is not lovely. Even if she doesn't have her hair fixed, right? Or if she doesn't know how to cook. The Bible says, love her. It's a command. Love her. All right? Now, I said all that to show you that this is the love that comes from God to men that flows out from men to people who are in need. You say, Brother Mumford, how can I be used in the gifts and ministries of the Holy Spirit? Let me put it in a nutshell, and then I'll come back and explain it. I found out what Paul was talking about. You know, since I have been moving more fully in the love of God, the Lord has used me in every one of the gifts of the Spirit. Every one of them. I don't claim anything. He's, oh, look, I found a man who has all the nine gifts. You are kidding yourself. I don't have anything, literally. But you know something? I have gone to a meeting. Now listen to me. I have gone to a meeting, and I see a man there in great distress. Uh, he had a face full of broken commandments. Sin was written all over his face. And I walked into the meeting and I looked at him. And I looked at him and something began to move in my breast. And I said, oh God, oh God. And you know something? God's love began to work in me. And I said, oh God. Now you see, there's nothing more frustrating to love somebody and not be able to help them. And when I began to love that person, I found out that God gives the gifts to be able to help them. Oh, my. My, my, my. Oh, I have watched God move through some of the most unlikely vessels because they had a heart full of what? Of God's love. Most of us, 
most of us, all our Christian life, live on phileo. Said, the pastor didn't shake my hand, right? And I'm not coming back anymore. <laughs> I said, goodbye. <laughs> oh, I said, oh, you can't put up with that kind of business. But you know, there is a love. There is a compassion. There is that kind of love that is flowing from God into man and out through man to those who are in need. Now, I want to draw you one other little diagram, if I may. And uh, if I can, this will help you to show that uh, how this thing how this thing functions in its outworking uh, in in everyday in everyday life and this is why God can you here is God God is what this is what He is that's His nature that's His yes. being and so God's love flowed into Adam here's Adam God flowed into Adam and He said. I want you to reach out to creation. He said, oh, Adam, you are my instrument. You are the one that I will use. Name the beast, have dominion, and this way it's all. So God's love flows from God to Adam, out from Adam to creation. Now, let me just put a couple things down here. Israel, Israel was that next choice. And you know something? They became all self-centered and all they wanted to find out how holy they could get. And suddenly they forgot their commission. And, uh, and as we move into the New Testament, he said, the kingdom of God should be taken from you and given to someone who should bring forth the fruit. The next person here was the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was the love of God flowed through Jesus out to creation. He loved, he healed, he delivered, he ministered. He was the channel of God's love out to those who were in need. And we have one other one here, and that's the church. Here we have the church of Jesus Christ, and they are the instrument of God that is flowing out to, out to creation. Now, will you turn back with me to, to uh, 1 Corinthians and chapter 12 and verse 31, and we want to make this applicable if we can. Um, God's love dwelling in a man, working in a man, being in a meeting where there is a need, and I used, to, I used to pray, Oh God, Lord, if I only had the gift of healing. Oh, if I only had it. Boy, if Brother Jones was here. Right? Isn't it sometimes we pray? Oh, if Brother Jones was here with the gift of healing, then we could pray for this man. And I, I, I've watched this over the years, you know. And then Brother Jones comes in, and, and usually Brother Jones would... I hope there's no Brother Jones here. <laughs> but I don't... I'm just using names, uh, fictitious names. But in comes Brother Jones, and there's something about the one who claims a healing that he sort of starts getting a little bit... Um, oh, man. I said, uh, do you folks need me? <laughs> and uh, we sort of get feeling our oats a little bit. Of course, you never did. Nobody here. I, I, remember the, I remember the day, the first time I ever gave a word of prophecy. I was in my home church. I'd just come home from the Navy, and I began to prophesy. And the words were something like this, Behold the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And as I began to prophesy, I could feel my head begin to swell. <laughs> I said, oh, hallelujah, the church got themselves a new prophet now. <laughs> I'm really moving in. This is, this is what I've been waiting for, you know. And, and, and of course, I, all the while I was getting proud, I was saying, I won't get proud, I won't get proud, I won't get proud. And I did anyway. Now, I wish we had time. To open to you the first chapter, the thirteenth chapter of Corinthians. I would like to do it quickly, if I may, because under this basis, when you go to a meeting, you go to a meeting tonight, and you know there are people in that meeting with needs, 
And you know there are sick people. How many of you ever watched Oral Roberts on the television closely when he was praying for the sick? Have you ever watched him closely? You see that compassion and that love swell up within him as he reaches his hands out. What do you think is flowing out from that man? God's love flowing. Now let me tell you, my sister, and you, my sister, and you, my brother, and you, my sister, God's love can flow through you also. There is not one person in this meeting whom God will not use and surprise you when he does if there is any sense of divine love or compassion for those who are in need. I've gone to people. I, I was called on one time. I, I don't claim the gift of healing. I don't. I don't move in that realm primarily. And yet God has used me in this realm tremendously. And I, I went to a, picked up a baby. I was in evangelist work. I picked up a, a baby who was malformed in its intestines. And I walk into that and she, this woman was dependent. She thought I was God's gift to people when I came. And I was a scared little preacher. That's what I really was. And I walked into that home and she says, Reverend Mumford, this baby is going to die in two days if God doesn't do something for this child. It has malformed. Uh, intestines were never formed when it was born. And the surgeon says, there's nothing we can do for it. And I looked at that baby, and I picked that baby up out of that crib, and I held it before God, and I said, Oh, God, oh, God, and do you know something? Do you know what healed that baby? <laughs> God's love. Amen. There was such compassion in me for that child. There was such, there was such this divine compassion for that child. There was enough love there to heal a, 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 the whole nursery, had there been anybody sick. But there was such love there. And I picked that child up and I held it before God. And I said, oh, God, God have mercy on this child in Jesus' name. And, brother, I felt God's liquid love come from God into me, down my hand into that child. And I said, Mother, it's going to be all right. <laughs> and, uh, brother, they, she called me a day, uh, day and a half later in the afternoon. She called me. She says, Brother Mumford, it's happened. The baby's healed. The doctor don't understand it. I said, Glory to God. <laughs> well, what are you saying? Are you bragging? No, sir. Now the bit. I used to brag. I used to feel I had certain gifts, but now I feel the gifts have me. <laughs> I feel he who is the gifts is laying hold of the church and the love of Jesus Christ as its functioning. Now I have watched God use the most the most un, the most unlikely people in prophecy. Tongues, interpretation, healing, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. He said, oh, Brother Mumford, the Lord wouldn't use me. Oh, no. You just sit there and get all full of love. And there's a lady in the wheelchair, and there she is, and nobody cares for her. And you're getting all full of God's love, and you feel it building in your heart. And you said, oh, you don't know, Brother Mumford. If Oral Roberts was here, wait a minute. What are you here for? What's, what does God have you here for? What's God, what, are you, what, what did he fill you with the Holy Spirit for? He filled you with the Holy Spirit so that he could use you for his glory in whatever realm or dimension that he would choose to use you in. If I have sat in meetings, we have a meeting at Princeton, at Princeton New Jersey. Seminary students and others come. University students and, and uh, businessmen from there are 75, 80 every Friday night. Amazing meeting. And you know, one of the things that marks this meeting is this love of God that's flowing in the meeting. And the word of prophecy, word of knowledge, gifts, ministries of the Holy Spirit are operating there solely because God's love 
is working, and everyone feels part and parcel, and they feel they are capable of God's being able to use them. Now, um, can we say a few words from? Uh, can we say a few words from First Corinthians chapter thirteen? I felt we should do this today. If you bear with me for just a few more minutes, we'll say a few words from First Corinthians thirteen. Now, people have said this is a love chapter. This isn't a love chapter. This is a gifts chapter. Brother Mumford, I read a commentary just recently, well, not just recently, a year or so ago, on the gifts uh, on 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And he says this, in the midst of, her, uh, in the midst of, of, uh, of Corinthians 12 and 13, or between uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, God has placed the love chapter so that it could be sandwiched between two teachings on the, on the errors and the difficulties of the Christian church. And I started to laugh. Because 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 are all teaching the gifts of the Spirit. And it teaches us how we might be used in the gifts and how we might become channels for God to use every one of you. I taught like this one time in a young people's group. It was in, uh, it was in uh, Youngstown, Ohio, I believe. Is it Youngstown? Somewhere. Brother R.A. Smith's church, K.A. Smith's church. He was teaching the young people's meeting there. There was about this many young people there, 10, 12, 13 years old. And I began to teach on, if you have a heart full of love, God will use you. And these young people come to me and said, Brother Mumford, that's what we've been looking for. You mean God can use us as teenagers? I said, he sure can. The pastor said later, he had so many prophets and and tongues and interpretation that those kids were moving out, brother. They were, they were moving out in the ministries of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they had a heart full of love. Do you know the greatest thing that I need when I come to a meeting? I need somebody who loves me enough to care for me. That's what I need. Now, if there's a lady, all right, here comes, we're in a, we're in a meeting, and uh, I want to illustrate this so that I don't miss anything, but suppose we're in a meeting, we have our little prayer meeting, and I hope it's not a Acts 2-4, bless us for no more Acts 2-4 kind of a meeting. You know what they call bless me clubs? <laughs> but I hope it's not that. But we have a little prayer meeting in our home. And here comes a woman into the meeting, all painted up like, like, a, like a Comanche Indian. And uh, it's evident that she's the town prostitute. Or she's a woman of the street, and you can see it from her life that she's a mess. Jesus met one like that at the well. And you know something? His love began to reach out to her. And, and what gift? was in operation. Anybody know? What gift was in operation in John 4? The word of knowledge. And he looked at her and he said, go call your husband. She said, sir, he's not my husband. He said, true, and you've lived with four men and the fifth one you're living with isn't your husband. Sir, sir, and the whole contents of her heart was open, and his love reaching out to her. Now, can you see him sitting on the well, and he said, Oh, God, use me in the gift of knowledge. Oh, God, use me. No, 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 no. His love reached out to her that God imparted the gift that was ministered to her because he wanted to meet her need. So you're sitting across from her. There she is on the other side of the meeting, and the rest of the people got a sort of a holy than thou attitude. <laughs> she is a so nasty lady in our meeting. And suddenly your, your heart is full of the love of Jesus. Oh God, 
Lord, meet that lady tonight. Oh, God, transform her into something. Oh, God, uh, and I'm letting my love reach out for her. Oh, God, love that woman tonight. Oh, God, meet her needs somehow. Now, it may be God will use somebody else. It may be. Suddenly, there's tongues and interpretation, and the woman's heart is exposed, and she falls on her face before Jesus, and her needs are met. What really met her? The love of Jesus. And the gifts and operations are there to bring that woman to know the love of Jesus. And she falls over. So I'm sitting there and I'm reaching across the room. And I've done this so many times that it just, it's a practice with me now. I'm sitting in a situation and I look across the room and I pick out somebody who needs loving. <laughs> and I said, oh God, how many of you know it's the crabbiest people that don't want love? Right? It's people who don't want love who really need the love. And I start loving them. And they say, I don't want you to love me. But I know God's love. And I say, well, I'll love you anyhow. <laughs> and they curse and swear and use bad words. And I said, I'll love you anyhow. I'll love you anyhow. How many of you here today was conquered by God's love? Let me see your hand. Let me see your hand. God's love chased you down and conquered you. Isn't that right? <laughs> you see, when that thing begins to function, the gifts are just as easy as falling off a log. He just, they're just there. And I've reached over. I, I, I walked up behind a lady one day, and, and I, don't, I don't have a word of knowledge. I don't claim the word of knowledge. I walked up behind a young lady in a, in a church. I'd never been there before in my life. She's kneeling there praying. I reached up, and I put my hands on her head, and her pastor's there with me. And I spoke these words to her. I said, Behold the word of the Lord unto thee. Thou shalt forget that which is in the past, and thou shalt look to God for that which is new. And she dropped right in her tracks like you had to hit her with a, with a tube before. <laughs> and the pastor started to weep, and he said, he said to me, Bob, you don't know what you said to that woman. I said, why? He said, her husband just run off with another woman. And she's been grieving for these many months. Grieving, grieving. And you know, when I went up behind her, the love of God for that woman was so strong. And I, and I thought, oh, God, help this woman. And when my love reached out to her, the word of knowledge functioned in my life. Speak a word to her, a word of knowledge, word of prophecy. Spoke a need to her. And the pastor said, I was there for a week. Her countenance, her joy began to manifest itself. And he says to me, Brother Mumford, she's like a different woman. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because it's God's agape, God's love flowing out from a man that meets the needs of people. You say, Brother Mumford, will God use me? I'm a housewife and I have 17 kids. I said, amen. Hallelujah. Uh, you see, there is no limit. There is no educational barriers. There is no spiritual pride. There is no, there is no come. Now listen, you can spend all your life seeking, coveting the best gift. I want the gift of miracles. But when Peter and John walked up that road to the gate beautiful and they looked at that man, <laughs> they looked at him and, and they said, well, man, we don't have any silver or gold. If I have any, I'd give it to you. But what? Uh, Oh, I got something in there. Oh, he said, oh, he said, oh, Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Now, I don't think they started out planning on healing that man. Peter said, John, do you see the gift of healing I have? Oh, man. How many of you ever seen the power group? You ever been in a church where they have the, the power group? They all always, oh, wait a minute, the love of God. Is the power of God. <laughs> and he said, he looked at that man, he said, oh, and he reached down and grabbed him by the hand, and he said, rise and walk. And you know something? It really works. But it works. Now, now remember the words we read, faith which works by love. Now, this is what I'm saying to you. Gifts 
which function by love. If you truly know a heart full of love, all the nine gifts, ministries, operations are open to you, and God will... How many of you have been surprised when God used you? Let me see your hand now. Come on, I want you to see we all belong to the same club. <laughs> That's right. How many have been surprised? I said, oh, Lord, use me. And the Lord said, all right, I will. And then he used me, and I was more surprised than anyone else. When he used me for his glory, and I thought, oh, Lord, this is so good. But one of the great advantages of this is that in this business of loving people, pride just gets kicked right out yeah, the back yeah, door. <laughs> there's just no, there's just no place for it. In in, in Washington, and some of you were there. That young man. Uh, there was a man who was who was dealing with a young man. He's about 20 years old. He hadn't been in the Washington Convention. Ten minutes, I don't think. They walked into the door, and I walked over to this brother. And he turned to me, he says, he said to me, Pastor Mumford, here's a young man that's not saved. And I turned around, and I looked at this handsome young man, very well built, very well dressed, evidently well educated young man. And I turned around and looked at him, and, and, and I was so filled with the love of God, I said to him, son... Don't you want to love Jesus? And then he started the ball. And his tears going to... He said, yes, but I don't know how. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to show you. And I lay my hands on his head. And I led him to Jesus. He got saved. Oh, at first he said, I can't. I can't. I said, what's the matter? He said, I'm bound. I said, amen. We cast a demon out of him. Loosed his life. Got him saved. And that night he got filled with the Holy Ghost and God healed him with stuttering. <laughs> All in about, in about four hours' time, God's love ministering. Now, I am not a demon caster outer kind, but I sure tangle with the devils when I can find them. <laughs> if it's the demons that are standing between God's love and that person, we go after them, don't we? Amen. If it's, if it's a sickness that's standing between a person's life in Jesus and a new understanding, then God's love begins to reach out for them. I wonder, I wonder if we can say a few words from 1 Corinthians 13 real quickly. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm long-winded. Maybe I better quit here. I don't know. Let's... Um, let me just say a few words here from 1 Corinthians 13. I'll just say a few words, then we'll come back, and then I'll be finished. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, beginning to read at verse 1 and 2, or verse 1 through 3, please, he says this. Now, will you notice something? It says, I am nothing. Now, this has been, this has been misinterpreted so many times. Now, if somebody stands up, for pride's sake, and said, I'd like to give $10,000 to the building program, and you know that that person is doing it because of pride, is there anything wrong with the $10,000? Anybody here who wouldn't take $10,000 even if it was given with a wrong motive? You see, this is what people don't understand, because when people use the gifts, out of the wrong motive, there's nothing wrong with the gifts. I have watched people praying for the sick who was evident that they were all filled with pride and arrogance and all kinds of things. And I used to look at it and I say, Lord, how could you do that? And Lord said, I used you, didn't I? I said, yes, sir. And he said, there's nothing wrong with the healing. You see, if, if God uses somebody to get you healed... And they did it, and they went all over town bragging about it. There's still nothing wrong with the healing, is there? See? So he said, if I have tongues of angels and faith and knowledge to move mountains, and I don't have love, there's nothing wrong with the gifts. It's what? I am nothing. You see? You're the one that loses out, because these things are going to pass away, and what? God's love's going to stay there, and you're going to get left with a short end. 
<laughs> You're going to miss all that God wants to do for you. Now, as I went down through this, I want to say a few words about verse 4 through 8, if we can, just very quickly. Charity. Now, this word in the Greek is agape, the same word, God's love. Now, when we think of charity, we think of the Salvation Army, don't we? That's a, that's a shame that that word was translated like that. But this word charity here is agape. It's the same word that's used in other places, God's love. Now, he says this, the love suffers long. When? When does love suffer long? I'll tell you when love suffers long. Love suffers long when somebody else is trying to learn how to speak in tongues. How many of you ever been in a meeting when somebody was trying to learn how to prophesy? And you're sitting there and you said, ah, is she going to prophesy again? Oh, I get so tired of her. She's always trying. And there's somebody's trying to learn how to prophesy. And they say, yay, thus saith the Lord, I... Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the Lord loves you, and you think, oh, no, we're not going through that again. Love suffers long when people are trying to learn how to be used in the gift. This is what is involved here. This is what the whole chapter is all about. It's about the gifts of the Spirit. How many of you have got... Don't put your hands up. How many of you have got people in your church? You think, oh, not her again, not him again. Oh, is he going to start speaking in tongues again? Oh, I can't stand it. Love does what? Suffers long. He waits. You know, there's no such a thing as learning to be used in the gifts without making mistakes. Nobody learns to walk without skinning their knees. Nobody, but nobody learns to walk without skinning their knees. Let's just look at a couple of these other things. Love is kind. Oh, uh, I have seen people so very unkind. How many... Ooh, I better not ask that question. Um, I've watched people, uh, after you've done prophesying, somebody meet you at the back of the church and they said, I don't receive that, brother. Ooh, ooh, they're right there ready to cut you up in little pieces. They said, that's not the word of the Lord. Ooh, and they, but you see, love is what? Kind. And he says this, love doesn't envy. How many of you ever had the green-eyed monster when God used somebody and didn't use you? <laughs> Come on. I, I wonder how many of you would be honest with me today. Come on. Bless you, sister. Come on. Is there anyone else going to be honest? You said, Lord, how could you use her, not me? I have a friend of mine who's in a church in Norfolk, Virginia, and he's praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This often happens between husband and wife. I've seen husbands get so mad because God used the wife and didn't use them. But uh, uh, he's there praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He puts his hands up and he says, Lord, I'm ready to go for you to the ends of the earth. I love you with all my heart. And he went on to tell God how ready he was. And, and, and there was, a, there was a, a lady beside him, weighed about 350 pounds. She had an old dirty wash dress on. She had about 20 kids. Ignorant just ignorant backwoods farmer lady and there she was and she puts her hands in the air and the Lord slayed her in the Holy Ghost laid her out and she spoke in tongues for about an hour and a half and he looked at her and he said God what's the matter with you <laughs> he said here I am young healthy sailor ready to go to the ends of the earth and you didn't fill me and you filled her I've watched God use the most unusual people and I've watched him use people make me turn all green. <laughs> See, love doesn't envy when somebody else is used in the gift. 